we start a new decade, worldwide conservation issues are very much in the headlines. We are now realizing the massive scale of our impact on the global environment and on other species. This is especially so in mankind's own birthplace, in Africa. Fortunately, some remote and beautiful areas still exist, such as the Virunga Volcanoes region of Rwanda, just south of the equator. Let me take you there, on a unique safari to watch one of man's closest living relatives in its last remaining habitat. In these mist-shrouded forests lives the largest of the world's primates, the mountain gorilla. Changes in forest boundaries during their evolution have left them isolated from the more abundant and more widespread lowland gorillas of West Africa. With only about 300 left in these forests, mountain gorillas are among the rarest and most endangered species on Earth. This is a rare view of their daily lives. Gorillas have evolved in tropical rainforest, or jungle as we often call it, which was once widespread across the equatorial region of Africa. But all rainforest is not the same, even within one area. Local differences in climate, soils and altitude creates a mosaic of different subtypes, and this affects the movements and distribution of forest animals, such as gorillas. In this tropical mountain paradise, they wander through the forest in search of their favorite foods. Let's join this family group of 12, led by an adult silverback male known as Beats Me, who is 25 years old. Later, we can move to other groups, just as the gorillas do themselves. Gorillas live in fairly stable social groups, which may consist of just a silverback, an adult female, and their offspring. Males become silverbacks at about 14 years of age, but the hair of females never turns silver. The family can increase in size by animals joining it from other groups, mainly young females who have just reached sexual maturity at eight years of age. Mountain gorilla groups of up to 30 exist, much larger than seen in lowland gorillas. The groups can disintegrate if the females leave or the leading male dies. It is the silverback who decides where they wander and when they feed.
Foraging and feeding are the main activities in every gorilla day. The slopes between the volcanoes, called the saddle areas because of their shape, are the last refuge of Africa's unique Hargania forest. Their huge crowns are wide apart and let lots of light through to the forest floor. This becomes covered by a dense undergrowth of herbs and vines and is ideal habitat for gorillas. Their diet includes almost 50 different plants, but their main food items in the saddle area are thistles, goosegrass, nettles and wild celery. An adult male may eat between 20 and 30 kilos per day of this bulky food, hence their huge pot bellies. They are very selective feeders and carefully peel many of the stems before they are eaten. From some plants they eat only the leaves and from others the roots. This wild celery is probably their favourite food. Each gorilla has a unique pattern of wrinkles on its wide nose. We can recognise Beats Me by the V-shape above his nostrils. There is another silverback in this group. He is 12-year-old Titus, and his nose has a broken T-shape in the centre. Three-year-old Kiriyama's nose also has a small T. His mother, Papoose, has a distinctive cut in the upper part of her left nostril. The sharp spikes in the leaves of thistle plants are no protection against the tough hands and tongues of gorillas. Feeding bouts may last for two to three hours, and arguments may occur when someone moves too close to another's feeding patch. Beats Me gives loud pig grunts to try and stop such disputes from becoming fights. Rainforest is a three-dimensional world, and in the high rainfall and humidity, the branches are covered in moss and hanging ferns. The gorillas are good climbers and are able to collect the ferns even when they are high up in hargania trees. They are obviously enjoyed and are eaten by the handful. Only a detailed chemical analysis will show exactly what they gain from eating them. They may contain essential vitamins, or help the gorillas to digest other plants more effectively. The gorillas carefully discard any roots or dead fronds, and only eat the fresh ones. Suddenly, it's time to climb down again. Beats Me and Titus are moving off to forage elsewhere. These day journeys cover distances from a few hundred metres to several kilometres. Each gorilla group has a fairly well-established home range. Since there is no shortage of food, the gorillas do not need to defend specific territories, and so there is a great deal of overlap at the edges of the ranges. They learn the details of their home range as they mature within a family. Animals who change groups could have problems. 
Hence the importance of the silverbacks as leaders. Facing Mount Visoki, Beechme settles down to feed in a patch of succulent thistles. He has a bite wound over his right eye from a recent fight with Titus. Fortunately, it's healing well. Sometimes these bites can become infected and cause the gorillas to stop eating. In severe cases, some animals have died. This poses a problem to modern conservationists, for they could dart the animals with antibiotics. But some argue that this is interfering with natural processes. Another dispute breaks out, and this time Titus goes to investigate. But Beats Me carries on eating the thistles. Titus is taking more charge of the group as he gets older, and this also causes trouble between the two silverbacks. After several hours feeding, some have eaten enough and have settled down for a midday rest, or are busy with the other important aspects of gorilla daily life. Tuck grooms her three-year-old son and Datwa, and Brooks no nonsense. Although grooming helps to keep their coats clean, it has more important social functions and seems to be influenced by their place in the dominance hierarchy of the group. Whatever the reason, it is done very carefully and the gorillas spend lots of their rest time grooming. Fuddle, a mature female, suckles her one-year-old infant. He will be totally dependent on her until he is at least three years old. When he is older, he will be able to join the other infants in their favorite pastime, play. Is very important for the growing infants, for they learn social skills and sort out their place in the dominance hierarchy of the group. Papoose watches carefully in case the play turns into a fight. Until Ndatwa and Tuck transfer to this group a year ago, Kiriyama had no one of his own age group to play with. Now he enjoys himself and will take on anyone. Meanwhile, Beats Me tries to sleep in the sun. He is ever alert, and as yet another dispute breaks out, he quickly moves off. They reach a large hargania tree where Beats Me samples some of the bark. This is very hard and dry, but is eaten often. Infants copy what the adults are eating, though not always successfully. Even the roots are dug up to get at the bark. The group is now settled around the Hargania tree and once more all is quiet.
The dispute comes to a climax as Papoose attacks Tuck. Titus tries to stop them, but Beats Me turns on him as the two females scream at each other. Neither of them really wants to fight, nor do they want to back down, and so they are locked in a display of teasing each other. Until Tuck arrived in this group, Papoose was the dominant female. Now she is trying to assert her authority, but Tuck is not backing down. The two silverbacks watch from the sidelines. They will only intervene if a fight starts. Eventually, peace is restored and they all move off again. They have now climbed up to the higher altitudes where giant senecio trees grow. While infants play on the supple branches, Titus starts pulling them apart, for this is another favourite food item. He soon exposes the central pith, which is the only part eaten. Once again they are on the move. Beats Me may take them back down to the saddle area, or he may decide to climb higher. At 4,500 meters, Karasimbi is the highest of the eight volcanoes in the Virunga chain. Near the summit is the subalpine zone, where the temperature is often below freezing at night. It is a land of mist and strange vegetation. Giant senecios, lobelias, and heathers as big as trees dominate the steep slopes. Well above Beats Me's group, at an altitude of 3,500 meters, and with views to Mounts Mikeno and Visoki, we find another group led by an old silverback called Peanuts. His nose print is very distinctive. He's never had any offspring of his own, but became the adopted leader of six others when their groups split up after deaths. Five of these are younger males. Benoit, who is seven. Kohisha, who is nine. Sanduku, 11. Darby, 10. and Bilbo, who is nearly 12. Kubi, the only female in the group, is six, and is not yet sexually mature. Whilst the younger males try to mate with her, this is only in play. Play dominates the daily life in this group. They wrestle frequently and tease each other with blows and chest beats. So far, these have not developed into serious fights, but this may change as they become silverbacks. Then they may leave and live alone, or try to form groups of their own. But Peanuts is now in charge of the group, and he leads them off to feed. 
At these high altitudes, their main food items are lobelias and giant senecios. Just like Titus, they use their great strength to tear them apart and get at the crunchy pith. Most of the gorilla foods have a very bitter taste, which makes them almost impossible for humans to eat. The milky white sap of lobelias can burn severely if it gets into the eyes, but somehow the gorillas manage to eat it without trouble. Plants grow slowly in the cold at these heights, and the gorillas can soon have a devastating effect on the fragile habitat. Some of the senecios, which have taken hundreds of years to grow, can be pulled apart by the gorillas in hours. Since the range of the mountain gorillas is now very much reduced, they visit the same areas more frequently. Thus there is now far less chance for this vegetation to regenerate. Usually a group only visits this zone for a few days at a time, but peanuts stayed for over a month, and this made their impact much worse. These gorillas have been studied for over 20 years, and almost half of the total population of 300 are known individually. But since gorillas live for up to 40 years, we're only just starting to unravel the long-term effects of births, deaths, and transfers from one group to another. During the late 70s, these natural changes were increased by deaths from poaching, and these males were lucky that peanuts let them join him. Leaders of other groups would see them as competitors for their females, and they would not be mature enough to survive on their own. This unusual group is therefore of great interest, since it may give us some clues as to what will happen in the future dynamics of such a small population. One day, Peanuts became ill and stopped feeding. His breathing was shallow, and an old eye infection caused by a bite wound flared up again. He was darted with penicillin to fight infection, but he remained listless, even when the rest of the group gathered round him. They seemed concerned and came to look closely, but Peanuts just went back to sleep. It would have been possible to anaesthetize him and try to see what was wrong, but it was decided that this was interfering too much with a wild population. He stayed in the same steep ravine for three days without eating and was obviously feeling the cold. The rest of the group stayed close by, just sitting in the mist and waiting. Each day they would leave him and go off to forage. His pink gums show that he was becoming anemic due to lack of food. After a few hours, the others would return to sit nearby and rest.
Sometimes they would go closer, but Peanut stayed huddled up. After a week, in the misty forest which had been his home for 30 years, he died. Down near the borders of the park, over a thousand meters below, is another gorilla group. The leader of this is 19-year-old Ziz. He weighs about 200 kilos and is probably the largest mountain gorilla in the world. In contrast to Peanuts, he has lots of infants in his large family of 25, and he has a very close relationship with them. As in Beatsme's group, there is another silverback. He also likes the youngsters and often grooms them. This is 15-year-old Pablo. But Ziz is the undisputed leader of this group, and the youngsters follow him closely whenever he goes. Some travel in style. Mating by young males is usually interrupted by the silverbacks, and only they are allowed to mate at the height of the female's Easter cycle when she is most likely to conceive. This can lead to displays and fights between the silverbacks for the receptive females. Thirty-five-year-old Effie is a gorilla superman. This is her seventh baby. Six, like this one, were females. These are needed more than males in such a rare species. Its pale skin will soon darken and be more like that of this two-year-old. However, the nose print will not develop clearly until it is three or four. The rest of the group are moving off after a midday rest period and Effie prepares to join them. Some have already started to feed nearby. Effie's eight-year-old daughter, Maggie, comes to inspect the baby closely, but will not be allowed to touch her for many months. Then it's feeding time, and Effie needs to build up her strength. Her baby is suckling strongly and looks to be very healthy. Amahoro is now three and almost weaned, but even he sneaks back to suckle when he can. Effie is suddenly the focus of attention as she finds a large bracket fungus. This is a rare delicacy and others wait for any scraps. Two months later, there is another birth in Zizza's group, and to our surprise, the mother is Maggie. She is obviously tired, not surprisingly, for as far as we know, she is the youngest gorilla to give birth. The baby is healthy, and although only one day old, it holds on tightly to Maggie's hair. This one is a male. Some of the group are foraging and move off. Maggie is still exhausted, but she and her baby must keep up if they are to survive. She rests again as soon as she can, making a simple day nest for more comfort.
Aziz also tries to get some sleep, but the infants have other ideas. Mangi cradles her baby expertly as they both sleep. She has obviously learned from watching her mother Effie. Effie's own baby is already very alert. She looks down on her nephew. Soon they will join the rapidly growing kindergarten of the group. Later, they will be rugged enough to explore the forest vines and join in the rough and tumble play. Those who are now too old to play, sleep. Time to digest the morning's feast. If the sun comes out, they can sunbathe, for at night it will get cold again. Pablo, who is Guiza's big brother, is busy grooming Amahoro. He seems to be forming a small subgroup and one day may take them away to start a family of his own. Ziz has had enough of the infant's play. The deep growls means it's time to go. Gorillas often growl like this as they move off from their midday rest, and soon a chorus starts. This seems to warn everyone that the group is on the move, and they come in from their various resting places. Ziz appears to lead the chorus as it builds up. The infants take no notice. Flossie, the oldest female in the group, puts her arm around Ziz, who displaces Pablo. Flossie immediately goes and sits in his place. Some 50 meters away, Lisa and a few others recognize the signals and set off to join the main group. Guiza still prefers to travel underneath rather than in jockey style. For no apparent reason, Ziz gives a display. At times like this, the silverback can be unpredictable and aggressive. Infants have been killed during these displays, though usually this happens when a silverback takes over a new group and the infants killed are not his own, but the next ones born will be.
Now he seems calm and moves off towards Pablo again. He pig grunts, but once more gives way. They lead the group off for their afternoon foraging, and as usual, the infants are tumbling along at Ziz's feet. Once again, it's feeding time. It then becomes obvious that Ziz is setting off on one of his major walks or safaris and he has a particular destination in mind. He leaves the saddle area far below and starts to climb into the mist. They forage on the way. Here Lisa finds a nice patch of goose grass. She recently had a tooth abscess, which are common in gorillas. If she had died, then little Guiza could not have survived on his own. Fortunately, it is healing rapidly and she's now feeding well. Ziz climbs higher and higher. Soon they are up in the subalpine zone near the 3,700 meter high peak of Mount Bisoki. It seems as though the mist opens up a door to time itself and lets us go back millions of years to when the gorillas first evolved. As on Karasimbi, giant Senecios and Lobelias dominate the slopes. The crater lake of lava has long since cooled and been filled by water. Senecios grow even on the inner slopes and Alcamilla flowers carpet the crater rim. Ziz waits in the mist. When he goes on safari, he sets a fast pace, but stops frequently to let the others catch up. Once more Ziz pauses, but when Pablo arrives, he quickly sets off again. At last he has reached his destination. Here the gorillas dig for roots of grass and of the giant Senecios. As darkness approaches, they spread out over the slope and dig furiously. The gorillas like these roots so much that when they find a good patch, they sing.
Although some soil must be eaten with the roots, this can only be a small amount. So whatever valuable nutrient the gorillas are after must be in the outer layers of the roots themselves. It will soon be nightfall and they will sleep up here in sub-zero temperatures. Infants will snuggle close to their mothers for warmth. The next day, Ziz has led them all the way down again to the lower slopes of Mount Visoki. Here they rest and play in the warmer climate. Some of the older ones will be grateful for this change of pace and it will give them a chance to regain their strength after the exhausting climbing of the past few days. Life in Ziz's family is always more hectic than in the other groups. Whilst this may be because it is bigger, it is also influenced by his own lively and vigorous personality. The volcanic soil on these lower slopes is very rich and their staple foods grow in superabundance. Mountain gorillas eat far less fruit than either chimpanzees or lowland gorillas and only rarely eat grubs and ants. Whilst their vegetarian diet is nutritious, they must keep their huge pot bellies full of digesting food at all times. This is why visits to the subalpine zone are usually very short. They could easily cause a great deal of damage to any area by overgrazing it. But most silverback leaders seem to know when to move on and when the vegetation in a particular area will have recovered enough to be revisited. Thus the movements of each family group, when viewed over a period of many years, will appear as migrations back and forth over the various vegetation zones. Gorillas have evolved in these mosaics of different subtypes of tropical forests. To ensure their survival, we must make sure that the forests are not destroyed. This will also be beneficial to mankind, since the forests affect climate both locally and globally. A few of their favorite foods are seasonal. One of these is bamboo. This giant grass grows at altitudes around 2,000 meters. In this area of the volcanoes, much of it has been cleared by the local people to grow their crops, and only small patches now remain. Ziz knows exactly where these are, and when the new shoots will appear. They do so during the early rainy season in March, and again during the late rains of September. The rapidly growing shoots are quite brittle and break very easily. They are very rich in proteins and are probably the most nutritious of the gorilla foods. The gorilla spread out searching for them and pig grunt if anyone comes near their patch. But for the infants, it's just another climbing frame. Only the tender parts of the shoots are eaten. The outer bracts, which are covered in tiny hairs, are peeled off and discarded. While some take their shoots one at a time, others collect them by the handful and then carry them out of the bamboo and into the nearby herbs and vines. If there is one thing that goes well with bamboo shoots, it's a nice bunch of nettles. The group move from one patch of bamboo to another. Maggie checks to see where they are going. She didn't want to be left behind, but she is still very tired. 
It is possible that some of the gorilla births are timed to the appearance of this sudden rich food supply. Twice every year, the group will concentrate their feeding on these bamboo shoots for a month or two, until the taller shoots become toughened. Then Ziz will take the group to other parts of their range. But for now, they are enjoying a feast. Some of them also eat the leaves of the bamboo, especially Ziz, and they often form part of his mixed salad menu. But the bamboo is near the borders of the National Park. Here they come into conflict with another primate who wants the bamboo, and the land on which it grows, man. Rwanda is the smallest country in Africa and relies on this region for growing much of its basic foods. It accepts that it has the responsibility to ensure the survival of the mountain gorillas and their important forest habitat. But it is also one of the poorest nations on earth and cannot afford to put the needs of the gorillas above the needs of its people. Our unique safari was made possible by their sacrifices. They deserve all the help that richer nations can give them towards their conservation program.